speaking of Eastern fathers, um, who's an Eastern who went Western, is Saint Irenaeus of Lyon. And uh, he writes in, in, in Against Heresies, In the same way Mary betrothed to a man, but nevertheless still a virgin, being obedient, was made the cause of salvation for herself and the whole human race. Thus the knot of Eve's disobedience was loosed by the obedience of Mary. What the virgin Eve had bound in unbelief, the virgin Mary loosed through faith. Saint Irenaeus. Guys, we're talking second century here. Second century. That she was the cause of salvation for the whole human race. All right, this is not a, a medieval exaggeration <laughs> that blew out of, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's such strong language. Um, causa facta est salutis. Yeah. Um, the, and, and it's in the language of scripture where, like you were saying, like, I'll save some, like God, the, um, there are, there is a, a language where it is said in a direct way, which is in fact indirect or relative, you know, um, she's the cause of salvation, but not in a direct, uh, formal way. Um, but we still say it that way. And, and that's most holy Tego toko save us. There's, there is that sort of direct language that gives her gl glory uh, without all the distinctions. We're, we're not going to get into a bunch of theological distinctions when we're praying a litany. Right. We're just going to pray. <laughs> <laughs> it's understood uh, if you, you know, well catechized Catholic. Um, yeah. yeah. And you mentioned the Jerome one. Can you, can you quote that one again, Timothy? Cause that's a yeah, great quote. Yeah. So she's uh, yeah. So he says by a woman, the whole world was saved. Per mulierum totus mundus salvatus est. There it it's is. Pretty strong. <laughs> here's right. a, here's another one that, that uh, is from Pius the Twelfth. So now we're bringing it into oh, the, yeah, to the 1900s. But he says when he declared the dogma of the Assumption, the uh, calls her the supply the sublime associate of our Redeemer. Right, the Alma. Redemptoris Nostra Socia. So she is literally associated with the act of redemption. I think maybe we should spend a little time with that because even if you get a Protestant to say, okay, Our Lady contributed in a creative way. And I don't mean creative as in like you have really cool art skills. I mean, as a creature. She contributed the body and blood to Christ. But... At the cross, it was all Jesus. He did everything. Our Lady has no interaction there. What say you, Timothy Flanders? <laughs> I mean, this, this I'll be, I can't I'll say play it the Protestant. Than... You get to be. I, oh, the, okay. I just I, I just teed one up for you. Okay. And then you get to hit it out of the park. Well, I can't say it better than Pius the Twelfth in Myst Mystici Corporis. He says. She offered him on Golgotha to the Eternal Father together with the Holocaust of her maternal rights and her motherly love mm. like a new Eve for all children of Adam. End quote. I mean, break that down for us. I mean, it's kind of says so, it all, but I mean, it's... Yeah. <laughs> so um, Our Lady's fiat is her whole life. Her whole life is is the um, like Saint Simeon says, a sword shall pierce your own soul too. Yes. Can I read that? that? Can I read that one? Because it relates. Yeah. Yes. Oh, so yeah. This is Luke two, uh, verse thirty four. When Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, "Behold, this child is destined to bring about the fall of many and the rise of many in Israel, to be a sign, which men will refuse to acknowledge, and so the thoughts of many hearts shall be made manifest." And for thy own soul, it shall have a sword to pierce it. So when Christ on the cross, when the lance pierces his sacred heart, spiritually a sword pierces the heart of Our Lady. And and did Our Lady, um, <clears throat> did Our Lady fail to offer that in union with Christ? No, she offered like there. There's a great, um, I can't remember who made this point to me, but if you ever see a crucifixion where Our Lady is fainting and weeping and, no, that's not what Our Lady was doing. She was offering 
herself and her son. She was offering everything up at the cross. Okay, well, I want to spend some time here because I actually maybe differ on this. There is this debate in Catholic art. It's the swoon. The swoon. Some people say that any art that shows Our Lady swooning is heretical. And they tend to think that Our Lady should be standing there like a stoic warrior. But there is, there is certain art, I think it might be Flemish, where you know when you see Our Lord on the cross, He's up, and the, but he's kind of he's kind of curved like that. His body, it's kind of a Byzantine look. You mm -hmm. know what I'm talking about? Yeah. His body's sort of like. Well, often in those kind of paintings, you'll see down below, Our Lady is often being held or comforted by St. John, and her body is shaped the same way, right? So Christ is sort of art, and she's art, and that's to show the unity between them, right? That they're both. There's a passion, which is perfect and divine. And then there's a compassion, a co-suffering that Our Lady, I think that's beautiful and good. I don't think it's heretical. And no, I don't, I, I don't I think Our Lady no, just sir. stood there like, not going to cry. <laughs> not no, cry. certainly not. I mean, the sorrow uh, <laughs> the sorrow of Mary is there. I mean, there's other other liturg liturgical or pious devotions of that she suffered a martyrdom. And so she's suffering um, immensely more than any... Uh, mm -hmm. She's the queen of martyrs. Yeah, the um, bon adventure. So there is, okay. So there's, um, so there's a great suffering, and I mean, there's great sorrow and uh, swooning, tears, you know, weeping. Um, but she does that in such a way as to strengthen everyone at the cross and us as well yeah. uh, when we go to the cross. We like what I mean by that is is when when you see a suffering woman your instinct is to comfort that woman and in such a way that our lady um, builds us up in a sense, even as she's suffering, just as our Lord builds us up in his suffering, our lady also um, draws us to Christ, draws us, draws us to greater power. Um, even though at the same time, we still pity her. We still pity Christ. We still have this pity because we're also compassionating. We're, you know, there's so many devotions of compassionate the Lord. Think of our Lord's suffering, compassionate Him. Um, and so there's, there's, I get, I mean, there's just so many different real, so many different layers of meaning. Um, I'm not asserting that it's heretical. I'm saying that uh, if we consider it as Our Lady was overcome, I guess, uh, you know, like she was. She it's was... hard to describe it. I mean, <laughs> it's true. I, I think it's safe to, for all of us to say that Our Lady wasn't like, you know, sometimes you see in these movies where you see like, you know, the Italian grandma who's like flailing and, wasn't hysterical. and beating yeah. her breast. And, not hysterical. Yeah, yeah, hysterical. Our Lady was right. certainly not acting hysterical and causing a scene. Right. Um, but I do think that you know, St. Bonaventure said that it's, we can say that Our Lady is a martyr because, and this is, a, this is a great analogy. I just love this. So picture a deer that's being hunted and the arrow hits the deer, but it's not a fatal shot. However, over the next year, because of that wound, it slowly kills the deer. And Bonaventure says that how, how that's how it was with Our Lady a sword pierced her heart at the cross and that was the fatal blow that killed her mm. but it wasn't an immediate death right it was like an arrow lodged in there that over time just slowly brought about that so you could say that the arrow and the hunter killed the deer so you can say our lady was in a sense martyred but not like the martyrs that we know, like St. Lawrence or St. Stephen or something like that. And I think that's kind of helpful in, in, in a good a good way of understanding that. And of course, you know, this is a little bit controversial with some people, but not with the Greeks and not with the early Latins and not with Aquinas, that our, Lord, that our Lady did experience a separation of body and soul before the Assumption. She did have a natural death. What do you, what do you say on that, Timothy? Yeah, I, I've never f understood why that's controversial. Yeah, Coming from there. being an Eastern Orthodox, we always celebrated the Dormition, which is yeah. the falling asleep. That's what that word means, yeah. falling asleep, which means death. Yeah. And the, the icon is is her dead. 
Like yeah, the icon and the icon her has lying Christ in the holding tomb, her, her soul, yeah. and her body's so, down there. Yeah, I, I don't really. I guess I, I, it seems to be an outgrowth of the immaculate conception. So how could she die if she didn't have original sin? Which I guess I mean that's reasonable. Um, but I, it does seem. Um, yeah, look it up in Ott. He's he assigns a, uh, a sententia communio or whatever to that. I mean, it's it's in the dying. liturgy. Yeah, it's in the liturgy. Yeah, exactly. It's in it's in the liturgy. Like you, I um, <clears throat> what was the the quote from Hadrian, the um, in uh, I think the in the Assumption decree he quotes yes. um, a uh, a the former pope. pope. Yeah. So regarding her death, and it her is tomb. yeah. So it is funny that that it is pretty clear in there. I'm not sure where that controversy comes from or who's promoting that controversy, but yeah, I've never yeah. found that comprehensible coming from the Eastern Orthodox where right. it seems clear. Yeah. So <clears throat> because you were, people don't know this, you were an Eastern Orthodox poor Catholic. I was. Yeah. Yes. We need to talk about that sometime. We do. Yeah, yeah. a lot of people are uh maybe <laughs> watching. Are who think, jump. Uh, think the grass is greener, but I'm here mm -hmm. to tell you it ain't greener. <laughs>